Fallout 4 is a magnificently realized open world action RPG shooter, but it is also a game that is characterized by the existence of several interesting and occasionally problematic tensions. And I know, I know, I'm really late to the party here. Fallout 4 was released all the way back in November of 2015, and I only started working on this video in August of 2016, almost a full year after the game's release. It is for this reason that I will not be focusing in this video on retreading ground already covered by others. Much has already been said, for instance, about the tension generated between the sense of urgency with which the game treats its main questline on the one hand, You murdering, kidnapping psychopath! Give me my son! Give me Sean! Now! And Bethesda's go anywhere, do anything approach to open world gameplay on the other. Every conceivable good you could ever need is right here. If we don't have it, it's inconceivable! <laughs> I've got a few minutes to browse. Oh, goody! And while there is much I could add to this particular conversation, the scope of this video will be far too narrow for that. If, however, this is something you'd like to explore in greater depth, you'll find a link in the video description to a video titled Fallout 4 and Roleplaying by Campster of Errant Signal, a YouTuber whose incredible video essay series was recommended to me by JSF and which played a huge role in inspiring me to start working on my own video essays. So rather than simply iterating on what the likes of Campser have already said about Fallout 4, I wanted to do something completely different. Accordingly, we'll be looking at what Fallout 4 has to say about brainhood in general, and about the notion that you are your brain in particular. Where, in other words, does our sense of self reside, according to the neurocultural discourse of Fallout 4? And how does this compare to the neurocultural discourses of other games, past and present? We'll endeavor to answer these and many other questions in this episode of Aegon Rants. Destroyed Ahab. Well, come on. Let's not wait around for more horrifying monstrosities. Fallout 4 begins on a mundane and seemingly uneventful day in the life of the player character and her partner, who have together just birthed a newborn son named Sean. Then, a vault tech representative knocks on the door, announcing to the player character that Because of your family service to our country, you have been pre-selected for entrance into the local vault. Vault 111. A few minutes pass before reports of nuclear detonations begin to proliferate local television and radio broadcasts. The family is quickly herded over to Vault 111, where they narrowly escape the immediate fallout of a nuclear blast that was much nearer at hand than those which came before it. Hold on! Can't this thing move faster? Oh god. Oh god. Oh god. Oh god. Once inside the vault, the family is instructed to just step in here and put your vault suit on. Just step into the chamber. The pod will decontaminate and depressurize you before we head deeper in the vault. Just relax. As is revealed by one of the vault's terminals, however, the player character, her family, and several of their neighbors were, without their prior and informed consent, about to become human test subjects in a cryosleep experiment. After an undisclosed period of time, the player character is roused from her stasis, only to witness the kidnapping of her son and her partner being murdered. <laughs> The player character is then placed back into cryosleep and doesn't awaken again until some 200 years after the bombs first dropped. I'll find who did this. And I'll get Sean back. I promise. Thus begins the main quest line of Fallout 4. The player character sets out to find her son, a quest which leads her to cross paths with Nick Valentine, a synth turned private eye who lives and works in Diamond City. With Nick's help, the player character eventually tracks down the mercenary who murdered her partner and kidnapped her son, and whose name is revealed to be Conrad Kellogg. But Kellogg is less than forthcoming about Sean's whereabouts, triggering a violent confrontation which ends in Kellogg's death. And this is where things start to get interesting. Kellogg drops this thing. After conferring with Piper back in Diamond City, Nick suggests that we may not need the man at all. You're talking crazy here, Nick. Got a fault in the old subroutines? Look, there's a place in Good Neighbor called the Memory Den. Relive the past moments in your mind as clear as the day they happened. 
If anyone could get a dead brain to sing, it'll be Dr. Amari, the mind behind the memories. So the player character heads over to the memory den with Nick in tow to meet with Dr. Amari in order so that they might discern whether it might be possible for us to relive Kellogg's memories. Despite initially protesting, Dr. Amari soon relents and agrees to give it a shot. We'll talk in greater detail about this sequence later on, but for the time being I want to draw attention to the fact that we experienced Kellogg's memories unproblematically, in chronological order, and we were given no reason to doubt the veracity of the memories we're witnessing. In the overall, this isn't an especially interesting or engaging sequence. So why am I even talking about it? Well, it has nothing to do with the express purpose of the scene, which Dr. Amari sums up in this way. I saw Kellogg's life. The man who ruined my family. The man I killed. That's right. He was a human being just like the rest of us, and he had reasons for being what he was, however cruel. What I do find interesting about this scene is not that it represents a deviation from broader assumptions about how our minds work, but because it takes these assumptions entirely for granted. And none of this actually occurred to me during my initial playthrough of the game. It only dawned on me a few months later, when I was revisiting one of my favorite games of all time, Final Fantasy VII. Whereas we were able to establish the context for the Fallout 4 memory sequence in just a few minutes, it's simply not possible for me to do the same for Final Fantasy VII. There is way, way too much going on in this story, and we would need at least one or two additional videos to appropriately establish the context for the scene we're going to look at shortly. Accordingly, I'm going to have to simplify things a bit. So, if you're unfamiliar with the story of FF7, or even if you need a refresher, I've left a link in the video description to an excellent 4 hour review of the game by Kim Justice. I've watched and rewatched this particular review more times than I can count, as I think it's the closest anyone has come to doing justice to the game, its story, themes, and mechanics, and I can only recommend it. With that said, let's dive in. The vagaries of memory and personal identity are two of the game's central themes, especially as they pertain to the protagonist. Cloud Strife. We are told early on that Cloud was once a member of the Ultra Elite Soldier First Class, but that he is now simply a mercenary. Not even 15 minutes into the game, however, we get our first hint that Cloud is not exactly what he seems, and that his mental state is fragile at best. Later on in Disc 1, Cloud tells of his first mission as a member of Soldier First Class wherein he is dispatched to Nibelheim, his hometown, to investigate reports of monsters emanating from the nearby Mako reactor. This flashback sequence serves both as an origin story for Sephiroth, the game's antagonist, and is the first explicit demonstration of Cloud's fragmented memory. We conclude with a standoff between Cloud and Sephiroth, a climactic moment that Cloud would surely not have forgotten, and yet he cannot remember how this standoff ended. The group later heads to the Temple of the Ancients, where Sephiroth reveals that he intends to use the Black Materia to summon Meteor, and that the ensuing catastrophe would permit him to become one with the planet. Later on, the group finds themselves in the Northern Crater, where they eventually find Sephiroth cocooned in Materia. Sephiroth forces Cloud to revisit the flashback we experienced earlier, but with one crucial difference. Cloud doesn't seem to have been there at all. In his place is a man with spiky black hair, whose name is later revealed to be Zack Fair. Cloud tries to dismiss all of this, but in attempting to reassert his own identity, fails to recall when, precisely, he joined Soldier. Ultimately, Cloud submits to Sephiroth's will, and delivers to him the Black Materia. This activates the planet's emergency defenses, summoning several monsters from deep within the lifestream, the same lifestream into which Cloud then falls. The group later finds Cloud in a town called Medil, where he is said to have washed ashore in a catatonic state suffering from a severe case of Mako poisoning. After the town is attacked by Ultimate Weapon, the life stream bubbles up to the surface and swallows the town whole, including both Tifa and Cloud. And with that, we've arrived at the scene which forced me to think more closely about the one in Fallout 4. There are actually some striking similarities between the two scenes, even if they are very different on a deeper level. Whereas in Fallout 4, Kellogg's memories are mediated by Nick Valentine, Cloud's memories are mediated here by Tifa, and for the most part this makes perfect sense, as Tifa was physically present during several of the memories we explore. 
In Fallout 4, on the other hand, Nick mediates Kellogg's memory simply because he's a synth, and is therefore somehow able to allow us to visit the past as though it were a pre-scripted virtual reality minigame. On a more fundamental level, I think FF7 does a much better job of conveying the fickle nature of memory than does Fallout 4. We explore Kellogg's memories in a linear manner from childhood to adulthood, from an innocent kid to a kidnapping, murdering mercenary. And again, we are given no reason to think that the memories we're experiencing are anything less than picture-perfect recreations of things that actually happened. Cloud's memories, on the other hand, are complex and entangled. While there is only one path through this sequence, it isn't a linear childhood to adulthood trajectory. We find that Cloud is a social being, rather than a self-interested individual who simply does bad things because bad things happen to him. We learn that Cloud first aspired to join Soldier at the age of eight, because of a trauma that he and Tifa experienced together, but that he never actually succeeded. He was ashamed to be returning to his hometown as a lowly Shinra grunt, rather than as a member of Soldier, first class. So he hid in plain sight during his return to Nibelheim. Thus, even though it is initially suggested that the fragmentary nature of Cloud's memories is due primarily to his having been injected with Genova cells, this sequence concludes with the revelation that Cloud was actually there in Nibelheim all along. He was just in a different body, and therein lies the most fundamental difference in how each game frames selfhood in general, and memories in particular. In FF7, memories are a complex, entangled mess. They're tied to sensory experience, and they are inseparable from embodiment. In Fallout 4, memories are framed as scripted VR experiences, and bodies are considered disposable. But before we address that last point, we've one brief flashback sequence to go. After the livestream memory sequence, Cloud returns to the group and all seems well. But we still don't know why Cloud projected himself into the body of Zack in his memories. Well, at least until we return once again to the mansion in Nibelheim. Have you ever found yourself suddenly thrust into a memory of something that happened long ago? Something you hadn't thought about in a long time, as a result of having smelled or having seen something tied to that memory? Well, that seems to be precisely what happens to Cloud when he re-enters the basement of the mansion, where he is thrust into yet another flashback sequence, beginning with him and Zack escaping captivity, and ending with Zack being brutally murdered. This is the moment where Cloud came to assume the status, memories, and identity of Zack Fair, Soldier, First Class. And so it was that Cloud's memories became disassociated from his embodied sense of self, leading to the mental struggles he is forced to endure throughout the game's narrative. But embodiment is something Fallout 4 ignores entirely, and nowhere is this more apparent than in Vault 118, where all of the residents have had their brains removed from their bodies. Your residents are robots. Not robots, detective. Well, not exactly, anyway. <laughs> I believe the term they use is robo-brain. Back before the war, the residents decided the best way to wait it out was to put their brains inside robotic chassis. This is, quite literally, the embodiment of the notion that you are your brain. I haven't seen someone with a body like that in far, far too long. Thanks, I suppose. <clears throat> uh, I had some questions about the case. Surely you'd prefer to hear some tales from my storied acting career rather than talk about some dreadful murder. Not right now. I'll be around, languishing from your inattention. Now, before we can wrap things up, we need to talk briefly about an article titled Brainhood, Anthropological Figure of Modernity by Fernando Vidal. As a cerebral subject, Vidal writes, quote, The human being is specified by the property of brainhood, that is, the property or quality of being, rather than simply having a brain. Reacting to the thought experiment version of the above quoted formula, if the brain of A could be transplanted into the body of B, then it is not B who would receive a new brain, but A who would receive a new body. Leading neuroscientist Michael Gazaniga commented, This simple fact makes it clear that you are your brain. Neuroscientists' writings and interviews for general audiences, media discussions of neuroscientific research, and the vast neurocultural constellation we shall deal with below offer countless variations of such a claim. In this context, Fallout 4 can be understood as both a product of and a contributor to what Vidal calls neural culture, which he describes as consisting of the, quote, 
constellations of ideas and social forms whose common denominator is the view of the human as a cerebral subject, and to emphasize the construction of different norms, values, meanings, and identities through neuro discourses and practices. So whether intentional or not, Fall of Four contributes to these neuro discourses in a way that reinforces rather than subverts the assumptions underlying the ideology of brainhood. So you might be asking, what's the big deal? As Vidal explains, quote, the individualism characteristic of Western and Westernized societies, the supreme value given to the individual as autonomous agent of choice and initiative, and the corresponding emphasis on interiority at the expense of social bonds and contexts are sustained by the brainhood ideology and reproduced by neurocultural discourses. In this way, the neuro discourses of Fallout 4 run counter to its simultaneous emphasis on togetherness as expressed in various ways through the Minutemen questline. We've decided to support the Minutemen. We've got to help each other if we want things to get better. Still others might object to my reading of Fallout 4 on the grounds that its story has nothing to do with actual neuroscientific research. But Vidal makes a compelling argument to the contrary when he writes that, quote, whether ontological or methodological, the belief in brain self-consubstantiality seems to have impelled brain research. The idea that we are our brains is not a corollary of neuroscientific advances, but a prerequisite of neuroscientific investigation. If you remain unconvinced of the connection I've drawn between Fallout 4 on the one hand, and these broader neurocultural discourses on the other, consider that, as Vidal points out, quote, In 1981, Hilary Putnam used brains in a vat as a variation of the Cartesian demon that fools you into believing you have a body, and that there is an external world. Putnam imagined that while you were sleeping, a scientist removes your brain, keeps it in a vat, and hooks it to a computer that sends the kind of signals that usually informed your brain. When you wake up, everything looks the same as usual, only that you are, in fact, merely a brain in a vat. Putnam argues that if you were in such a situation, you could not think you were a brain in a vat. Although his goal was to discuss skepticism rather than personal identity, it is again significant that the choice of a brain fiction seems so natural as if investigating self-knowledge necessarily implied equating personhood and brainhood. So again, whether intentional or not, Fallout 4 references the brain in a vat trope constantly. But nowhere is this more apparent than in the Automatron DLC, the final dungeon for which is literally filled with brains in vats. This also raises several additional questions about the extraction of biovalue from the otherwise wholly devalued bodies of social, cultural, and economic undesirables. But perhaps that's an issue we'll explore in a future episode. So how do we explain the distance which exists between the presumption of brainhood in Fallout 4 on the one hand, and that of the personhood of Final Fantasy VII on the other? Well, it might have something to do with the fact that FF7 was released midway through the so-called Decade of the Brain, which Vidal describes in this way, quote, Neurocultural discourses and neuroethics with them mask the continuity that exists since the early 19th century in the main assumptions in the big questions being asked, and in the answers to them as well. The claim that the 1990s were declared the decade of the brain because the success of the scientific method partially replaced older notions of the soul or mind-body dualism with the doctrine that mind is the brain's exclusive output is typical of the ahistorical triumphalism characteristic of the neural field. So it's possible that FF7 just barely missed the neuro hype train of the 1990s, and that had it been released a few years later, we might have had a very, very different game on our hands. This is just one possible explanation, but it's one that we'll be able to look at more closely once the FF7 remake is released. I'm very interested, for instance, in seeing whether or not the game's overt environmentalist message is neutered, or if Cloud's apparent struggle with mental illness is framed around brainhood rather than personhood this time around. Put simply, the extent of the differences between the remake and the original might be able to tell us something about how the world around these games has changed in the intervening years. We might also explain the difference between Fallout 4 and FF7 by looking to the cultural situatedness of their respective developers. Fallout 4 was developed in the United States, the epicenter of neuroculture. So it's not terribly surprising that we see the values, assumptions, and aspirations of this culture reflected in the game. FF7, on the other hand, was developed in Japan, a culture with which I am not nearly as familiar. Unfamiliar with this culture though I may be, I do know a fair bit about FromSoft, another Japanese developer. So does FromSoft land closer to Bethesda, or what was then Squaresoft, in the brainhood-personhood divide? Well, in Bloodborne, the hunter's mark is specifically said to be branded on the back of the player character's mind and not their brain. 
or at least that's what it says in the English version of the game. The original Japanese text could very well be different. And yet, the image for the Rune Workshop tool strongly suggests that runes are physically branded on the player character. Similarly, some of the enemies in Kanehurst Castle will attempt to brand the player character with the Corruption Rune, the outline of which appears on the back of the player character's head, suggesting that mind and brain are, in fact, one and the same. Equally, the fragility not only of memories, but also of one's selfhood, is one of the central themes of Dark Souls 2, particularly in the case of Lucatil of Mira. And though we explore various memories throughout the game, and though they do appear to closely reflect the actual events being recreated, there is just enough uncertainty in the details of these memories to set them apart from that of Fallout 4. In other words, FromSoft seems to occupy a non-committal middle ground between Squaresoft of the mid-90s and Bethesda of today. Now, don't get me wrong, I adore Fallout 4. I didn't pick up the game until a few months after its release, but it's given me an absurd amount of enjoyment all the same. Sure, the AI is often stilted and buggy, but that's part of what makes it so endearing to me. The daily choices you humans need to make regarding life and death must be quite a burden. I appear to be well built for travel. You should be commended for a job well done. Never fear, sir. I will ensure your safety to the best of my ability. Despite how rigid and mechanical everything seems, this is still a game which allows you to not only imagine a different world, but also to bring that world partially into being. I mean, in what other game can you build a home for dozens of synthetic gorillas, or build an army of robots and task them not only with keeping the peace, but also with delivering food and supplies to those in need? While the stilted nature of Bethesda's AI does mean that every now and then innocent lives may get caught in the crossfire, the game nevertheless permits you to take its wasteland of a world and to make it a considerably better place. Unfortunately, this also rubs up against the game's naive belief in linear scientific progress in general, and its failure to say anything meaningful about the ideology of brainhood in particular. In other words, Fallout 4 wants you to build a new, better world, but it also refuses to let go of even the most problematic aspects of the old one. I guess that also explains why you can't scrap these damn pre-war houses in Sanctuary Hills.